If doctors told us that we'd made a breakthrough on COVID-19, we would rejoice. We'd feel hope that we could live our lives again, get back to work, back to doing what we want. While masks are a ticket to that freedom. We can help protect others and save lives by covering our noses and mouths, which is how the virus mainly spreads. Until there's a vaccine, grab the breakthrough that's already here. When we're out, it's masks on. A message to help keep you safe. Brought to you by the Ad Council. to get as close to the real thing as possible. And that's not that complicated in theory. The complicated part is in practice. And can you find those fabrics? You know, can you actually make a garment like it was made in 1952? Ebbetsfield Flannels is a company that makes authentic, historically inspired sportswear. Everything we make is based on original historical research and made in the United States. We never think about trends. We just stick to what we do. The timelessness is the most important thing. Athletic garments had an aesthetic golden age or a a peak period. And that period for us is roughly between 1920 and 1960. There was a certain elegance to the design. When they designed lettering that script or Seattle Rainiers, those things have a classic look to them. Jerry is a historian at heart. You know, whether it's the gauge of a stitch or if it's a plated fabric or the different wool flannels, he really studies it and then is tenacious about getting it recreated, even when people say, no, it can't be done. And we just don't take no for an answer. We do small batch, singular, made to order. The center of the product line are the authentic historic baseball products. The wool baseball jersey, the authentic soft crown wool cap, and the authentic wool and leather sleeve jacket. Now to round that out, we've got what we call our grounds crew jacket. We are now getting deeply into American-made vintage athletic sweaters. We're going to be doing um, 1920s, 1930s style real wool football and hockey sweaters. We're literally going from American sheep to the wool, to the wool processing, to the yarn, to our knitting machine. So that's kind of exciting because we get to kind of reinvent another iconic American athletic product. You know, it's 25 years and we haven't even hit our stride with everything that there is that we could be doing. The two words that we like to use are authenticity and timelessness. Although we are making more and different products than we did in 1988, the mission hasn't changed at all. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available. A curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, let's get this thing underway, shall we? How are you, everybody? My name is Tim Hanlon, as you know by now, hopefully. uh, And the podcast that you have uh, stumbled across, of course, is called Good Seats Still Available. It's our weekly journey, uh, each and every week, for that matter, into what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for finding us. Uh, if you're a return guest, we uh, welcome you back. Uh, if this is the first time you're listening, well, where have you been? Pull up a chair or uh, have a seat on the stoop or or whatever you're doing. Put us in your earbuds. We appreciate you finding us. And uh, hopefully we uh, delight you to no end this week. Uh, and I think we will. The uh, clip sets it up nicely, doesn't it? Um, you know, uh, commerce is certainly part of our journeys into uh, the, uh, the, the worlds of defunct and, and forgotten and, uh, relocated teams and leagues and the various stories. Uh, and, and Lord knows we've got a, a whole host of great sponsors uh, over the years that have been, um, frankly essential, uh, in helping us uh, keep some of those memories. And, and a number of you, thank you very much for doing so, have, uh, have explored those, uh, those great, uh, sponsors over the years. And, uh, and continue to uh, uh, to remember those uh, those same teams and leagues that we talk about here, that we try to bring to life in sort of oral history, uh, by buying a shirt or a cap or a, a potential uh, you know an item of uh, of historical significance, an artifact, a uh, 
uh, you know, a, a program, a guide, whatever it might have been. Uh, but I think all of us can agree that uh, perhaps sort of the uh, the pinnacle of um, of commerce offerings uh, is uh, a site known as Ebbets Field Flannels. Actually, it's not a site. Well, it is now Ebbets.com. Uh, and you know, of course, where it's uh, named after, of course, the uh, the mighty Ebbets Field back in the day of Brooklyn Dodgers uh, fame. Um, it was established in 1988 in Seattle, of all places, by our guest this week, Jerry Cohen. Yeah, he's the founder of Ebbets Field Flannels. Until recently, it was a store uh, as well as a uh, uh, an office and a factory. Uh, the store, unfortunately, uh, this year... Uh, like a lot of things this year, uh, kind of uh, just saw its uh, multiple challenges. Uh, you know, that with the pandemic and and uh, various things of social upheaval and and just frankly, just the idea of of keeping a store afloat, a small business afloat in, in the midst of so many different challenges this year. Um, unfortunately, that that showcase store in Pioneer Square in Seattle uh, is uh, is no longer with us. Perhaps it comes back to life at some point down the road, but. Uh, Ebbets Field Flannels, uh, thank you very much, is very much alive and continues to do a an amazing business. And it's an amazing story uh, and it's an amazing offering. And it's um, best encapsulated in our conversation with Jerry Cohen this week. Um, it is uh, the quintessential uh, resource for uh, truly authentic, uh, handcrafted, small batch uh, and painstakingly his, and historically uh, researched uh, items and garbs uh, of all kinds of, of, of things. So they'd be ball caps uh, and shirts and flannels, of course, the original uh, impetus for starting uh, this uh, this firm back in 1988 was uh, uh, Jerry's uh, uh, obsessive search uh, for uh, his own um, uh, baseball garments uh, in particular, uh, those of the Negro Leagues, which, uh, you know, at the time back in 1988, were still sort of this, um, I don't know, not sort of a uh, fully culturally embraced thing yet. This is obviously a number of years before the Ken Burns baseball series and 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 certainly the uh, the episodes devoted to the Negro Leagues and, and sort of a, a, a wellspring of interest uh, sort of from that. This is even before that. And uh, in, in that quest, uh, you know, Jerry uh, and uh, and his uh, colleague, Lisa Cooper, um, who joined a couple of years afterwards, um, uh, really found a, a niche and then some uh, in not only uh, trying to recreate and bring back to life some of these original uh, uniforms and jerseys and, and things related, um, but also, frankly, uh, surfacing the history involved in all of them. Um, and it's uh, it, it, a labor of love is it doesn't do it justice. It's and it's a passion project and then some. But it's it's not you know it's no charity for sure. It's a, it's a business a a small business that continues to chug along very well. Thank you. Um, that uh, is just absolutely. I, I, I guess I can't come up with a, a, a better description. It's it's the ultimate expression I think uh, of this harmony of uh, historic reverence uh, meeting. Uh, uh, clothing and um, and quality at that, uh, and there's there's no better place, frankly, uh, to to uh, enshrine and uh, and frankly uh, have take a little piece of, if you will, for your own, uh, than an Ebbetsfield flannels, which not only is uh, like its namesake sort of implies, uh, devoted to uh, various teams and leagues in and around the various uh, uh, incarnations of professional baseball, but minor leagues, the Negro leagues, all those kinds of things, but also other sports as well. And it's not just jerseys, but jackets. Uh, and and uh, we said jerseys, uh, utility shirts, um, hockey sweaters, all those kinds of things. So uh, Ebbets Field flannels uh, is, uh, it's a it's just a wealth of great memories uh, and painstakingly uh, thought through uh, items that uh, are authentic uh, with a capital A, not only in terms of uh, their deference to the stories uh, and the histories behind them, but frankly, the the materials that have been sourced uh, to create them. Uh, God forbid they uh, they mimic and or uh, exactly uh, uh, replicate uh, the actual and authentic uh, environments uh, from which they come, uh, and and hopefully, frankly, uh, as uh, uh, Jerry and Lisa have been trying to do for years, uh, you know, uh, literally try to bring to life 
uh, what might have been, say, back in the day, if you wanted to be wearing or perhaps were lucky enough to be playing uh, for one of these teams in these leagues. Um, and I will tell you, like I said before, it's not just uh, a baseball, but uh, lots of old school NFL stuff and and college football stuff uh, and hockey stuff. And uh, to uh, uh, soccer geeks like myself, uh, a newly uh, created collection of stuff that uh, actually goes back into the 60s uh, and early 1970s professional soccer scene here in the United States. Both the American Soccer League uh, as well as the North American Soccer League and the two leagues that preceded the NASL, the United Soccer Association and the National Professional Soccer League. Uh, these are all topics and teams and, and stories and leagues that we've talked about on this uh, this little show over the years. Um, but if you're looking for, for example, uh, the United Soccer Association's San Francisco Golden Gate Gales, 1967, the only year that they were around, soccer jacket. My God, it's gorgeous. And it's it's it, not only is it, it tailor made and custom made, but it is it is authentic to the, the very last stitch. Um, our recent episode on the Oakland Clippers of the National Professional Soccer League. Uh, you can get a jersey as well as a soccer jacket. Um, these are just gorgeous. How about the Chicago Cats of the American Soccer League in 1976? I mean, these are amazingly uh, well-crafted, and uh, I, I never thought I'd see the day when I'd be able to find not only jerseys, but but things related, such as these jackets and these ball caps. This is fantastic. Um, just a mere smattering of uh, of the stories and the items that are found at Ebbets Field Flannels. The site is ebbets.com. And, um, and the story that, uh, that Jerry will tell us uh, in the moments to come, uh, it's just fascinating. It's, it's a great little look back into why people f are fascinated by these, by these logos, uh, by these um, graphic designs, by these teams, by these leagues. Uh, what used to be in the past. Maybe, maybe you weren't even around uh, when some of these leagues existed, but, but, but you have, for whatever reasons, fallen into the rabbit hole of trying to find out why. Perhaps you grew up uh, following a team and maybe want to understand uh, why that team or how that team came to be in the first place, or perhaps uh, what sort of preceded it. Um, all of that stuff uh, is uh, embedded in this great conversation with, with, uh, Ebbetsfield Flannels founder, Jerry Cohen, uh, born, uh, raised in Brooklyn uh, by way of uh, beautiful Fairlawn, New Jersey, a mere stone's throw where yours truly grew up, Hohokus, New Jersey. Yeah, it's got two hyphens in it. You can look it up. And uh, it's not only a story of New York and sports, but uh, just sports fandom, uh, passion, uh, history, uh, authenticity, all of those things, all of those ideals uh, are all wrapped up in this, this wonderfully, uh, surprisingly uh, just... Uh, uh, great conversation uh, with uh, Jerry Cohen coming up in uh, just a moment's time. And uh, uh, in a special sort of promotional fashion, we've got a, uh, a promo code for you for the first time for our friends uh, at Ebbetsfield Flannels. Uh, the website is ebbets.com. That's E-B-B-E-T-S dot com. And the promo code that you can enjoy for the holiday season is Good Seats 10 Good seats and the number 10 will get you 10% off everything at Ebbets Field Flannels. And you know that that the quality is high and the prices are um, fair, but they're not inexpensive, right? And uh, and there's a reason because these things at Ebbets Field Flannels are the highest quality stuff you can find out there. If you're going to celebrate any team or league uh, or any sport uh, from the past, uh, Ebbets Field Flannels is the best place to find the best garb out there to commemorate. And at ebbets.com, once you find those items, uh, by the way, not just for yourself, I'm sure you're going to find some things you can all want, I'm for sure. Uh, but for those sports fans in your life, um, why not save a little scratch by doing so and using that promo code GOODSEATS10. Again, at ebbets, E-B-B-E-T-S dot com. That's Ebbets Field Flannels. And lest you think that this is just a promotional shill, uh, it ain't because uh, the whole reason for uh, me uh, taking all this time to finally get in touch with Jerry uh, and uh, celebrating Ebbetsfield flannels. Again, I have purchases from 1989 and 1990 uh, still sitting in my closet. Um, 
it's uh, it's a tremendous and special place, uh, and I am uh, honored uh, to have a conversation with the founder uh, of that special place. It's our conversation with Jerry Cohen. Here it is. Uh, please, as always, enjoy. First of all, I, I want to say thank you for um, taking time and indulging me in this little uh, exploit that I've been doing for almost four years now around sort of this uh, exploration of, uh, of teams and leagues and the various stories, et cetera, uh, for whatever reasons, no longer with us. And, you know, we try to broaden the uh, uh, the focus uh, a bit to not just being sort of, you know, pedantic and historical and musty and old and, you know, uh, uh, you know, blow by blow, so to speak, about sort of the stories and stuff. And then we try to elongate it into things like uh, art and design and, and commerce and culture and all that kind of stuff, because it's to me at least, and I think maybe uh, to a lesser extent, perhaps you, uh, this stuff is fascinating to me, the, the history of sports, especially the stuff that's no longer around for whatever reasons. And um, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to sort of uh, consider yourself a kindred soul because I, I barely know you, but I feel like I do because I've been uh, um, uh, perhaps not as a, a consistent a customer, but certainly one of your earlier customers from way back when. But I, all of that is just a, a way, a, a, a elongated way of saying um, uh, thanks for, for being part of the conversation. And maybe you could help our audience a little bit by giving us some background as to who you are and how the idea of Ebbets Field flannels came about in the first place. Sure, love to. Um, well, obviously, my name Jerry Cohen, but uh, I've been doing this about 32 years. So that would take us to 1988 when we started. And, uh, you know, what you said resonates with me quite a bit. I think we are kindred spirits because I've always been more fascinated by the, the road less traveled in sports. And as I used to say to people, who needs another Yankees cap? Um, it was way more satisfying for me to to be a kind of an, uh, an archivist and a historian and uncover things nobody had known about or very few nerdy people like myself maybe knew of, but, but nobody else. So um, it's, it's amazing how much has changed in that time, but how much has not changed. And the, the passion for doing things that are unusual and finding stories that maybe have not been told uh, remains kind of the driving the driving force here at Ebbets Field. All right. Well, what's your what's your background uh, that got you started into this? Was it graphic design? Well, Is it commerce? Something completely different? A, absolutely no business background and, uh, <laughs> and no clothing background. Um, so to to go back a little ways, you know, I was a kid growing up in the '60s is my coming of age with sports in the New York area and. I loved, for, for whatever reason, uh, graphics um, like on caps and on football helmets, on uniforms, was a thing that I really fell in love with. So the baseball cards where other kids would get them for the player, I'd get them to see the uniform changes. And uh, back in the black and white days of television, you kids before your time, um, you know, it was the only way for me to see the color uniforms in baseball. So every year when the new cards came out, I'd run and get them just so I could see what the Washington Senators uniform looked like or whatever it was. Um, and then, you know, I drew them a little bit. I'm not a great artist myself, but I do have a very, very good uh, graphic sense of what looks right and what what doesn't. And I think that sort of served me when I started the company, because fast forward to 1988, I was a musician playing in bands locally in Seattle. And I wanted one of those old flannel baseball shirts and couldn't find one and, and uh, bought a couple of things that were very disappointing. And that's really what got me obsessed and led me into researching the fabrics and the woolen mills and the original um, artisans. I call them artisans, but they were just regular workers back in the day who created this stuff. Um, and that's really what got me started. And I think my passion and my interest really was uh, enough that I was able to overcome my lack of experience and lack of initial um, business sense, perhaps. I had enough of it to, to keep going. 
but um but I think just just my enthusiasm for what I was doing and the message is what I think won people over and and uh, allowed us to to establish a little foothold in in, in this area. Well, how, how do you get over the hump and and go from idea and research and and just passion and interest into the mechanics of getting, uh, if you will, maybe you didn't even think about it at the time, a company up and running? Because you know, in some respects, you you have the benefit of not knowing what you don't know, and in some cases, right. especially when you don't know what you're getting into, it's actually a a benefit because you're not sort of overwhelmed by all the negative and and, and, yeah. and scenarios that will prevent you from going forward. Well, that's what I meant, exactly what I meant by enthusiasm. I was so enthusiastic. I mean, nothing about this business was conventional. I had no college education. I had no business education, certainly. I didn't know even what a financial statement was. Uh, you know, someone suggested at the beginning that I write a business plan, and my answer was, what's that? So I, I had to go learn how to, you know, I think people really who are younger don't appreciate it much how how much you had to work to do things that we take for granted on a couple of computer clicks on the Internet now. And I don't mean to be the old guy saying how great things were in the old days, because in a lot of ways they weren't. However, for example, to do that business plan, I had to go to the library and rent typewriter time, you know, to use a professional grade typewriter to write write my business letters and that sort of thing. So, um, and then all the research was physical. I mean, I had to travel to places where there were archives and libraries and photocopy machines. And, and that's, you know, the first few years I did a lot of that. Um, so, you know, the, it, it was, I'm, I'm making it sound like it was difficult and it was, but like you said, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was all fun for me because it was a journey, you know, it was a journey of exploration. And the more I found, the more excited I was. And that made me feel compelled to create products that I hoped would uh, get other people excited. How, how did you know that there would be, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, a market? I didn't. <laughs> there was no, I think people thought I was insane. <laughs> Some people, but, um, but I didn't. And, uh, and, and I thought, you know, if we, if we do something with beauty and with integrity and with authenticity, um, people will, will come enough people to, to get us going. And that's actually what happened. Well, so talk to me about that authenticity thing, because if anything, uh, that's that uh, oozes out of this brand and has for decades now is is that uh, whether it's by design so to speak or or mm -hmm. uh, by happenstance I, I don't think it's by happenstance it, it, your your brand stands for has stood for uh, being authentic I think to the point of being uh, not only well researched but maybe even painstakingly so if I remember some of the stories about some of the items that have been birthed over the years or recreated or 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 discovered so to speak uh, i i got to think things like photography and microfiche and oral histories and and re other kinds of things have have um not only sort of unearthed these things but but it's pretty clear to me that you've taken quite a bit of time and effort and pride frankly in in trying to make sure you uh, quote unquote get it right well, oh, absolutely. And I think that does come through. You don't have to be an expert at something to appreciate the attention to detail and that, that, you know, not just my company, but many others I could think of are known for. And, and what, um, I say now to people, because there's a lot of people doing it is any idiot with a website can be a t-shirt company and throw a logo on a t-shirt. And, and frankly, more, there are more and more of those folks, um, God bless them, but it actually takes some work and commitment to create garments the way they were made in 1950 or 1940 or 1930, and to do that well, I mean, in many cases, we've had to go to mills and fabric suppliers and actually ask them to produce fabric that hadn't been produced in half a century, which I can tell you is not an easy trick. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think going to that level of extreme to get something right, uh, hopefully is appreciated and, and anytime, you know, uh, with social media now, um, 
there's a lot more, I would call superficial commentary than there used to be. So sometimes people will just react to price and say $50 for a baseball cap. And our answer is always yes, only $50 for the greatest vintage baseball cap that is possible to buy that'll last you a lifetime. So I think context is really everything. Um, but because the sports market in general is flooded with so many different apparel products of varying degrees of quality, most made offshore, uh, it's if you're if you think that a uh, certain cap company's cap is the is the standard, uh, and it's a thirty five dollar cap, and then someone comes along at fifty dollars, um, maybe that person doesn't quite understand the context. And usually when it's explained, well, this is what we're doing. We're sourcing original wools. We're hand sewing felt lettering, et cetera. You know, then, then, uh, then maybe it's a little more appreciated. So I was never interested necessarily in being, we can't be the biggest. There's, there's companies that are much bigger than we are, but we can be the best, at least at what we do. And we try to focus on that. Now, obviously, the name Ebbets Field obviously is is evocative of of, of Brooklyn. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, sure. if, if that has any personal resonance for you or just yeah, I'm from I'm from there, and and in fact, I was born the first year there was no Brooklyn Dodger baseball was the year I was born in Brooklyn. So I I like it's first of all, it's a little tip of the hat to my dad, the name, and then secondly, I like the symmetry of the fact that I came into the world. Uh, the first year there was no Brooklyn baseball and this is sort of a way of, you know, connecting with that. Um, and so, and it just, it's alliterative, the company name. So, um, when I thought of it, I, I kind of liked it. Well, no, it's also, uh, it's also cosmic, I guess, in that respect too, right? Sort of, a, a you know, it's, yeah, it's very circular yeah. and, um, so then obviously though, baseball, right. Was the first and perhaps at the time of, yes. of its founding only, right. Which lends yes. itself not only, well, the idea of a baseball uniform or Jersey, right. Is very, especially historically fabric centric, right. So that's, mm -hmm. you can see where that overlap sort of happened. So, so why baseball? And, and I, I think I kind of know some of the reasons why specifically baseball and then why, where, and how do you even start? like to circle around where within this sort of big monstrosity known as baseball, because yeah, there's minor leagues, there's, there's foreign teams, there's Negro leagues, there's, there's yeah. major league baseball, that kind of stuff. How do you start? How do you carve out your little niche to start with? Yeah. Carving out a niche is, is exactly what we did. Um, well, we, we were telling a story and we wanted to be heard. And it occurred to me that the way to be heard is to, to tell stories that maybe were not told or over told. And for that reason, um, the thing, the two um, areas I focused on initially uh, and for very good reasons and different reasons were the Negro leagues and uh, the, the old Pacific coast league, meaning up through 1957 before the Dodgers and giants took their main territories. So in the case of the Negro leagues, the connection is Jackie Robinson. If you, Jackie Robinson, if you were think of our company and me, you think of Jackie Robinson, because that almost ties everything together. Growing up, that's what my dad talked about. You know, the, the type of player he was, was who my dad modeled himself after. So the aggression, you know, the fierceness, and also this, the, obviously the, the, the social aspect of the fact that, you know, the, the indignities this individual had to go through simply to play a game. So that was very ins inspiring to someone who's six, seven years old. And, and at that time, we're not that far removed from that story. So that was really in me. And if you start with Jackie Robinson and you say, well, where does that go? Always follow the, the sort, go to the source, go to the roots. And, and if you go before the Brooklyn Dodgers, you go to the Negro Leagues where, where Jackie Robinson played one year on the Kansas City Monarchs. And that took me into the history of the Negro Leagues. And, and once I got there, I'm like, oh my God, people need to know about this. Now, of course, everybody knows about it now, but at the time there wasn't a 42 day in Major League Baseball. There really wasn't any, and there wasn't a Ken Burns baseball 
movie with Buck O'Neill that talked about it. So this was not known history. There were a few researchers and saber people and people like that, of course, who, who knew about it, but there were no apparel products, certainly. And so I thought, what a great opportunity to tell that story. And if we get the uniforms right, people can maybe get as inspired as I feel about learning about um, this area of history. So that's, that was one thing. The other thing, moving to Seattle in the eighties and reading about the history of the Pacific coast league, another thing not generally known was major league baseball used to be uh, a, a, a reality in 10 cities with St. Louis, the farthest West. So you had three teams in New York, two in Philadelphia, two in Boston, two in St. Louis. So only 10 cities in the entire country, no television. So in the Pacific coast, the, the coast league was, was really a de facto third major league. And also the, uh, the, the quality of play was nearly equal to major leagues. So you had Joe DiMaggio come out of that league. You had Ted Williams come out of that league. You left the O'Doul. Uh, and so those teams had their own followings, their own histories, their own, obviously, uniform histories, all were were very, very different and, uh, again, had not been generally appreciated or seen. So that was an obvious area for me to, to, to explore. So starting from there, you know, then you get into the other minor leagues and their histories, and then you go to Cuba, and then I went to Mexico. These are all physical trips I made, by the way, to Cuba in 1993, to the Mexican Baseball Hall of Fame in 1994. Um, and, and, and those were all kind of launching pads into these little relatively obscure areas of history. Yeah, so this almost, that's the word I keep coming back to here in your, what you're describing, is almost, this almost feels like uh, a history project uh, versus even anything commercial. You can call us historians. The rich story tradition of American sport is our archive. We started the company in 1988, part hobby, part obsession, with the belief that the original thing is already perfect. This is more about curating and less about creating. To craft handmade, authentic, historically inspired sportswear requires a deep commitment to and appreciation for the process. Every single stitch matters. Each holds its own history, a tribute to a bygone era. The fabrics, from the highest quality woolen mills. The colors, borrowed from the pages of a history book. The lettering, reproduced with meticulous care. It's an authenticity that looks back, yes, but it also looks forward to longevity, to integrity. We call it vintage authentic. You can call it Ebbets Field Flannels. You know what? What has to happen? There has to be kind of a confluence of history, graphics, saleability. Obviously, we're in business. We have to make some profit to do what we do. Um, we we can afford to have some. You know, I always compare it to. Uh, I'm I'm happy to bat 300. If I'm batting 300, I'm doing good. Um, in other words, if three out of 10 ideas are very successful, we're doing really, really well. And then I can afford to put out the little story that only I care about. We don't sell a lot of, but I got the story out, but we got to have those things that drive sales, obviously. And, um, and so, you know, if, if the history comes together, the graphics and the story, you know, all of that come together, um, then you've got a successful Evans Field garment. All right, so so let let's skate into though an issue that obviously gets very uh, uh, challenging and and complicated and convoluted, right? Which is the realm of so you're describing those things, which are uh, at least in your earlier years, right? Are sure. I guess from a commercial perspective, uh, and I'm sure you've learned since, relatively straightforward and potentially easy to kind of. Uh, bring to market because I'm guessing most, if not all of those logos and trademarks and stuff were essentially defunct and or uh, public domain, right? Um, at, at that time, yeah. yes. So, so no, I, no longer the case. Yeah. So let's, I, I guess I sort of, because we, we've talked about this for on, on a couple of different occasions. Uh, our, our pal Waylon Moore, mm -hmm. um, uh, who uh, lives in the Atlanta metro area, was the guy who designed the 
original Atlanta Chiefs, uh, North American Soccer League, okay. the Cosmos Soccer logo, uh, some uh, Hank Aaron uh, Braves uh, era uh, stuff for his uh, the the year that he broke yeah. the home run record, um, and you know th- there are it's it's very interesting to know when things sort of come and, and I'm a big soccer guy and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, yeah, we just started doing the Cosmos. Yeah, just, which is deal. we just did a licensing deal with the Cosmos. Okay, so great. so th- which is official, which is great. And number two, as a Cosmos yeah. fan, as a kid, uh, doubly great. And then, yeah, and then yeah. and then third, right? But that that brings up a whole sort of set of issues, right? So, mm-hmm. um, how do you tackle that both then when you were getting going and then now? Um, mm-hmm. to stay, if you will, on the, the right side of those things and, frankly, even discover to know where any of these trademarks might have gone uh, well, and, and, you know, and be successful and, and not sort of infringe and all that stuff. So I, I'm going to disappoint you and, and be a little uh, a clever here because our strategy in that regard is proprietary and does give us a little bit of an edge and has been very successful. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about how we do what we do. Um, I will say, however, that we always respect people's trademark rights, unlike some of our competitors. And um, if there are owners of trademarks, we, we try to make deals with them, in which case we're usually we're successful. And if there are no trademark owners and someone decides they are one, we are very well prepared, uh, uh, to tell them usually to go pound sand. And that's happened quite often because people don't understand trademark law. So for example, um, I'll just give you one very early on, uh, one of our most successful teams still is is San Francisco seals of the Pacific coast league. So we're into this maybe two, three years and we get a letter from some lawyer saying that they have filed a trademark registration for the San Francisco seals and, we need to now bow down to them and get permission. Well, unfortunately, trademark law doesn't work retroactively. You you, you may fool an examiner uh, occasionally for a short period of time, but you can't sit on trademarks and you can't decide years after something has um, passed out of usage that you would, you want to own it. Trademark follows use. So in our case, we were already using the mark, which nobody had owned and somebody coming after us and deciding they wanted to own it simply because they paid $200 to the U S patent trademark office was a failing, a failed legal strategy. And that's happened many, many, many times. And, uh, and perhaps because you were uh, generating some interest anew in something because you had something commercially viable that brought it to people's attention, right? So our biggest protection actually is actually having products in interstate commerce. So once you do that, it's very difficult for someone later to come back and say, Oh, you can't do that because I think I own this. Uh, You can, you can make any claim you want, but you won't be successful. Um, We have almost never had a situation where somebody has said to us, you're not using this with our permission. And we, indeed still own this and the one or two times in 30 years that that's happened we've been able to make uh, 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 agreements with those entities and then in other cases we just have conventional licensing agreements like anybody we have one with the nfl uh, we have one where we've had one with minor league baseball for 27 years something like that um so so to answer your question Every situation is different, and we're pretty good at knowing what we can do and what we can't do. I will say that. Yeah, and I guess I, it's probably getting – it's really interesting when you um, uh, go back and try to sort of follow the trail of, say, a team's history uh, from city to city right. or uh, iteration to iteration. Um, and I, I would imagine it even gets more prickly when you get into – uh, like I, for example, I can imagine. I mean, if you let's pick, uh, I, I don't know, pick a, a a basketball franchise in the NBA, and and I, the the lack of NBA stuff in your, yeah, uh, yeah. your offerings is maybe telling on this. But like you know, you you want to go back to like the Basketball Association of America, which one of the predecessors sure. of the NBA, which itself was, a, yeah. you know, a, a, an amalgam of things that were company teams, which weren't even professional leagues, so to speak. 
Um, exactly. That's just an example, and maybe not the best one in your case. But but where do you, you know, where does it get clear, and where does it sort of like get into like complete haze? Because I can understand an NBA wanting to go back all the way into that history and then pull it all the way up to the modern franchise and claim that that was an original route for a New well, Jersey Nets or whatever that is, right? Or Syracuse. I, I don't want to I don't want to embarrass any any anybody, but um the leagues themselves have failed at protecting their own trademarks. Uh and I and I, I'm not going to, uh, there's one very particular example, and I'm not going to name them because we have a relationship, but they lost rights to some of their defunct teams, even though they were clearly members of that league because they, they slept on it. Um, and, and so, uh, in fact, we wanted to reproduce some of those teams under license. And they said, we can't give you the rights because we don't have them anymore. And and if if smart people listening to this go to our website and see some omissions, um, that's usually the reason why. So so it's it's very very convoluted, and it's even if you're the NBA or the NFL or Major League Baseball or the NHL, you you can't necessarily. It's not as simple as saying oh the you know the. The Portsmouth, I'm just picking a team at random. I don't know if this is even true. The Portsmouth Spartans played in 1933. Therefore, we're going to now register it as a trademark. Um, it's not that simple because if there were intervening years when nobody used it and somebody else picked it up, that would be an issue. Uh, somebody could object to it, you know. Uh, so I, I do have some sympathy for the legal departments of these leagues who try to do this because they have to make a decision on how much money and resources it's worth spending to protect one team that played in the NFL in 1922, for example. You know what I mean? There's, there's no black and white, as you probably know. People think trademark law is like copyright. It's totally different. There's no black and white scenario. Every situation is different and unique. Yeah, for sure. And and it, this is also now the collision of, of commerce and, and, and business opportunity, right, which is arguably right. uh, has gotten much more pronounced over the last decade even or, or even, you know, maybe two, right, where this is a conversation like this is actually quite big business, right, versus, say, you know, 30, 40 years ago when, when it was almost – I don't know, more of a an arcane exercise into figuring out, hey, where does the Kansas City Comets – Sorry, where does the Kansas City Scouts, sorry, NHL history live? And do the New Jersey yeah. Devils own that? And does the NHL have the ability and or the the uh, uh, capability of going all the way back to the beginning franchise and just locking right. that down from, you know, which was a two year escapade that most people in, in NHL history, frankly, yeah. don't even want to well, remember, which is ironic, right? Because it was a failure. We are, we are respectful of our partners. So what I will say is in the cases where we have relationships, we have a relationship with Major League Baseball, we have a relationship with the NFL, we could, we choose to not um, challenge some of those things that we could, that may be in gray areas, because why do that? Why alienate your partner? It's it's disrespectful, and and it it may not in a business way be conducive to future opportunities. So we have some competitors. I don't think very highly of them, uh, their products. But uh, I had one competitor tell me on the phone. Uh, this competitor was selling St. Louis Browns and Seattle Pilots jerseys. And um, he said to me, well, I have a lawyer telling me I don't need a license. And I said, well, good luck with that strategy. <laughs> um, because, first of all, you're wrong. Um, uh, you know, and second of all, you know, you're, you're going to be shut down. Now, you may not be shut down tomorrow, but um, you will be shut down. So good luck with that. Um and so sometimes people assume because a team is defunct, there is no uh, there is no intellectual property yet. But that is absolutely not true. Just go out and try to produce a Brooklyn Dodger jersey without a license, for example, and uh, see how that goes. 
So we, we don't choose, you know, it's not like we're sitting here at its field trying to pick holes in the, in the uh, intellectual property of the leagues. That's, that's not what we're about. Um, there are other people who do do that. Yeah, I, I, and they obviously that's but you know that that also differentiates you and and the, hence the the sort of history of how you've done this right is uh, those those approaches tend to be more business centric or business first right or or money making oriented first um, right. but but yours is always yours yours is emanated out of sort of a love and a, and a crafting of 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 history and respect for that look I and you I think in many respects you put your money where your mouth is so to speak I mean you look at um, how you handle uh, some of the um, proceeds that you've made over the years uh, with some of the Negro League uh, uh, items uh, in partnership with the uh, ne- Negro League uh, Museum in, in Kansas City, right? In some respects, you're almost helping make uh, a, a right out of a, I want to call it a wrong, but but a, uh, there, you know, there there is no sort of uh, business lineage, right? There, But it does help perhaps right. reconcile some of that because of what's been lost to history. We, you know, we try to do some things that we are interested in, for example, um, regarding the Negro leagues. I'm very, you know, my other interest uh, besides uniforms is ballparks. So um, I was just in Patterson, New Jersey a few weeks ago looking at now, now this is a particular case that it's very very hard to know what to do because there as I found out and learned there is not like one fund where you could just donate and that money will go to the restoration of this particular ballpark. There's the National Trust is doing some things, the city is trying to do some things, but a lot of it is tied up in in various um political differences between these various entities that are all trying to contribute in some way. And all we want to do is say, you know, here's, <laughs> here's this money. Can we be responsible for restoring this ticket booth, for example, or this light standard or something? Um, and so sometimes it's not easy to actually give money, believe it or not. <laughs> we try, we want to give money. They're restoring satchel pages, uh, house in Kansas City, which was uh, badly damaged in a storm, and we tried to directly to contribute that, and the agent and the organization wasn't ready to accept donations yet. So um, there's there's lots of things that um, we would like to do that we haven't been able to do, um, but we we try to do what we can. We're a very small company. We're not Nike. So our, our resources are limited, but I think really the best things we've done is publicity and awareness. I mean, I, I like to think that our spreading the awareness of the fact of the Negro Leagues doing the turn back the clock games early on and those kinds of things really was a big key in getting Major League Baseball and and uh, a lot of other people interested in in honoring that history. So we may not have been major in financial contribution but we certainly were in terms of awareness were you were you the reason for for example the uh, uh major league baseball's uh what is it called the cooperstown classics uh, line that they came out with were you kind of the the, the reaction out for them doing that no i won't i won't take credit but i will say that um in 1988 there was us and mitchell and ness and and we were people think we were competitors, but we were almost sister companies, totally separate companies on different coasts. But Peter Capolino and I, who Peter is the founder, of Mitchell and Ness, not not any longer involved, but was the founder. He had this idea of uh, of doing the major league flannel jerseys when a customer came into a shop to have a I forget it. I think it was a St. Louis Browns jersey repaired. So there was nothing in the conventional licenses of Major League Baseball or the leagues that that dealt with a vintage product. So the two of us starting and basically at the same time with the similar idea, I think is what, you know, got Major League Baseball interested in creating a a whole category of of license for, for, for their history. 
that, that's interesting. I, and I, it also sort of brings me back to uh, one last thing on sort of the trademark stuff. I, I, I really, I had a direct question for Waylon Moore again, the the guy who created the Cosmos logo and the Chiefs logo and some of the Braves stuff. And and I, you know, I in the case of the Cosmos and the Chiefs, right? Those are well, Cosmos not so much, but the Chiefs, the Atlanta Chiefs. Uh, it yeah. fell out of trademark. I don't think anybody owns it. I don't, you know, and 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 he certainly you know, doesn't know or, or, or frankly get any compensation from it, right? Because he was just a, he's a graphic designer by trade, right? And I asked sure. him this specific question. I said, if I'm a fan and I, I see an Atlanta Chiefs shirt or cap or, or jersey or some other recreation and stuff, uh, uh, you know, I'm conflicted. Do I, do I make that purchase and know that it's in some respects almost stealing because there is no, I, I, I just I use the word stealing just because I can't come up with another word. But it's it's there is no owner of said logo. There is no trademark that's mm-hmm. that's discernible and that kind of stuff. Yet I want to you know wear it with pride because it's something that I remember. It's something that I'm interested in. It's something I want to share with the world. How do you feel about that? Uh, where do you sort of stand on it? And I was kind of expecting him to say, well, you know, um, you know I'm a little hurt by it. I, I wish I could, you know, but there's nothing really I can do. He actually said, look, this was a gig uh, at the time. I, I'm a, an assigned, you know, gun for hire at a, at a graphic design or a creative agency shop. Uh, it was my yeah. assignment. I, I took great pride in it. They liked it. I love seeing it on people's uh, jerseys. I love seeing it in advertising. And look, if people want to buy anything that's got that logo on it, I'm all for it because it 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 speaks to people's not only memories but they they like it for some reason and that's why you do what you do creatively. Yeah, I mean, I've thought about this question quite a bit um because well, I'm not I'm not surprised by it. I'll I'll tell you why because uh first of all, let's let's handle the legal part. Uh, you're, you're, he was absolutely right. Graphic artists usually are work for hire. You don't, you don't go get points for, for a logo, you know, ask the woman who designed the Nike swoosh, how she feels, you know, I mean, I don't know. She got paid $500 or whatever it was. But, um, I often think when I'm looking at some of this research that I, that I do, and I see a particularly interesting logo, um, who was the person who did that? You know, there are probably some per worker in a sporting goods company that got paid um, or some independent graphic artist that got paid for the gig. And that's what it was. And, and there's no shame in that. Um, but in our system, that's one when you pay to have artwork done for your for your company or your brand, you own that. You've paid for it, you own it, unless you make some kind of stipulation with the artist um, that they would have some kind of uh, say over its usage, which, which you know, nobody intelligent would ever do because you don't want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying, it turns out just, I, I'm not a graphic artist, but I designed um, our logo, both of the logos that we use. Um, but I had a graphic artist clean them up because I'm a useless uh, at at actually drawing. But I sketched it. I literally sketched one of them out on a napkin, and and that's what I and I took it to a graphic artist and I said, "Can you please make this look presentable?" And this is the concept, and these are the colors. And I paid the graphic artist. Now, if that graphic artist were to come back ten years later and say, "How much money have you made putting that on every piece of?" Uh, you know, every catalog and every label, and I want, you know, 10%, I'd say they're nuts. Um, so unless you ask for that, and sometimes graphic artists do ask for something like that, and you make that agreement, then, then you know, it's a totally ethical situation. And, and uh, the, the individual who designed, by the way, a beautiful logo, that Atlanta Chiefs, um, those were the conditions and the expectations he was working under. Yeah, and um, but it, it's also celebratory, right? In that, um, I mean, look, and and Whalen's, the, the, you know, he was the originator of the Cosmos logo too, which is ironic. But you have that a license. That and I all. didn't know. That, yeah, that's that's an incredible logo. Yes, that's an amazing logo, and, and one that stands the test of time. Even if the team somehow can't sort of get to that next level, but uh, you know, I, we still, as Cosmos fans, 
Uh, hope that it, uh, it, it and I don't want to get into the, the politics, politics, politics of soccer. But let me ask you that. So while we're on soccer, um, yeah. as a soccer fan, and that's sort of my uh, my uh, entree into this uh, crazy world of defunctness and, and relocation and all that kind of stuff, what took you so long? pal to get you into the, into the soccer that's business a, you know that's a great question um i don't know and I'll, I'll tell you something um i love the old nasl i was i was a pre-pele cosmos fan not only a cosmos fan i saw them in the old yankee pre-renovation yankee stadium worth with like two thousand people in the whole place you know playing god knows who yeah, it was but, it was um, 1971, and then they 1972 they went out to Long Island for a year or two. Exactly, I saw them there too at Hofstra University. Um, so, so that's that's how much of a Cosmos fan that that I was, um, and I loved when the NASL started, in, and I knew all about the history of actually the two leagues in '67, uh, and then the the merger which became the NASL. Um, and the fact that the other, the, the other league, which was sanctioned, you know, all this history, right? Well, the, yeah. We, we just, just recorded the other day. We, I don't, we haven't dropped it yet. Uh, yeah. uh, Derek Liechty, who, uh, was the uh, general manager of the, uh, old Oakland Clippers of the U S oh, okay. uh, yeah, the MPSL and then the NASL. And then they went on their own for a while. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So the USA was the other league, but they were the sanctioned league, but the NPSL was unsanctioned, but had the TV contract. So it's so totally bizarre why they would set up to almost like a death wish. Let's set up two rival pro soccer leagues and put teams in the same cities. Yeah. And kill it, kill, kill the proposition in two years. Yeah. Great. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I'm old enough to remember all of that in real time. I was a little kid, but I followed it. So I'm fascinated. I'm like you, I'm fascinated by all that stuff. So what took me so long? I don't know. Maybe just we're so busy, you know, there's always so much to do and, and to, to bring in another um, fairly obscure um, category is tough. I mean, uh, it, it was no fear of it being too obscure because God, I, I did a whole line on the continental football league of all things, you know? So, so um yeah, which another thing that fascinates me and nobody knows about. There was almost kind of a second AFL, but they didn't quite, you know, rise to the occasion like the AFL actually did. Um, so um, I've even done uh, a parallel on that. So, um, I don't know why it took me so long. I, I regret it. I think uh, what's challenging about soccer on an authentic way is there was no standardization. So, for example, uh, take 1900 to 1970, all the baseball uniforms were wool flannel. There were three or four basic patterns and three or four basic colors of fabric, right? So you got some kind of consistency. I have seen physically NASL jerseys from the 60s and 70s, and there are no two that are alike. They're all over the map. Some of them are the most horrible things you would ever want to see, that if we reproduce them, quote, unquote, authentically, they'd be awful, we would almost have to make them better than the original because they would be screen printed on the most awful fabric and others were just gorgeous, you know, using really nice fabric, but there's polyester, there is Doreen cotton, there is hundred percent cotton. So you can make a baseball Jersey and it could be 20 or 30 different teams by applying the trim and the emblems. Right. But a soccer jersey, you've got a V-neck, you've got a polo collar, you've got a crew neck, you've got a ringer neck, um, you've got other oddities. So from a manufacturing, a practical point of view, given that we don't sell volumes and volumes of anything, it's very difficult to produce anything in the quantities that our contractors and factories would need to and make it viable. That's the short answer. The longer answer is that if you know there there was a company, there still is in the UK, that does a very nice job doing vintage soccer toffs. You probably are aware of them. Um, and so we don't really – so yeah. some, Frank, with all due respect, not, 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 uh, some of those are, are pretty good and dead on, and frankly, some of them are just not, right, for the U.S. Uh, that's true. That's absolutely true. 
Um, but if you look at, and I still don't know how they do it. Uh, uh, if you look at their pricing, it's extremely reasonable. It's very hard for us to sell a Jersey for $49 of any kind. You know, we just can't, you know, there's no one who will make it for a price that we know of that we can afford I, again, unless we're making thousands in China. Um, and so, so they are already kind of in that, in that lane. And we didn't really feel like we had enough ability to come out there and, and tell a, a unique story. You know, I changed my mind obviously this year because I really wanted to get into that early NASL period, which we did. Yeah. And, and I, um, look, I, and I think there's, there's plenty more, uh, and look, I think frankly, soccer is also, you know, it's a much different place than it was even 10, 20 years ago in terms of, uh, its yeah. availability, uh, the, 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 the staying power of major league soccer itself, uh, a uh, uh, sometimes uh, a convenient, sometimes strained relationship with some of the old clubs that they took the names from, uh, and yeah. the, and the the various sort of tricks and turns of the, those histories as well. Um, but look, I you know you're talking to somebody who would love to see you, especially given uh, your attention to detail and craftsmanship, attempt the uh, Caribou of Colorado jersey with the fringe. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, to me, there's there's some great ones, you know. And obviously, you should charge a higher price for something like that. But uh, with well, the Atlanta Chiefs, go, the, yeah. Let's just go closer to home. You do you know how many vintage NASL Sounders and Timbers and Whitecaps jerseys I would sell? But I I went to MLS, and it was the biggest runaround I've ever got. They said. Well, we, we do own the rights to the, even the old teams by those names, and who am I to tell them they don't, right, given our previous discussion? And, uh, and I said, well, look, we don't want to step on anybody's toes of anything you're doing in licensing now, but nobody is doing this. And they said, well, we love it, but we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to say yes. This is what we often run into is people saying they love it, but they don't know how to say yes and just let us do it. And then they said, well, go to the teams because then you could do a local license if the teams are okay with it. So we went to the individual teams and they're like, we love it, but go back to the league. So it's like, okay, at a certain point, nobody could say yes. So I cannot offer a 1970s Seattle Sounders, even though we're here in Seattle and the MLS team has a huge following because the MLS clubs claim they own those three teams that were originally nicknames of totally unrelated NASL teams. Yeah, and it's also, there's a bit of, yeah, and look, and it's also, it, it with, as we've gotten into, there's been a, be, a begrudging acceptance of, of these team histories, right? Because MLS sure. at the beginning, and frankly, in some circles still, doesn't want to want remember to it. exactly yeah. because it was a failed league or whatever, you know. Exactly. I, I, the Vancouver Whitecaps of of your right, some of the gorgeous logos right, with the the, the, the uh, just, you yeah. know, I, just fascinating and 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 great opportunity. I have all I have. You don't have to tell. I have all the research, the warm ups, the jerseys, everything, um, and I've seen a lot of the original because I know a collector who owns them. Um, and, and if I wanted to be going back to our trademark, discuss, if I wanted to be a real, you know, you know what, I would just say, screw you. I've seen other companies do Sounders NASL t-shirts and various things. So I'm going to just do my Jersey and you can like it or lump it. But because we do our philosophy is we do like to treat, people with respect that we have chosen not to do that and maybe missed a big business opportunity. So there you go. But another, I want to, I want to, I want to add one little thing to that story because another thing we run into and we have had this happen with collegiate licenses as well is they want to say, yes, they love the product we've made in the sample, but then they say, we have a Jersey exclusive with X, Y, Z gazillion dollar company. Uh, I won't mention uh, Nike <laughs> um, or pick another one. And we're afraid that if we let you do this, even though they're not doing a vintage or a historic piece, that this will um, make them mad. So, so that's another reason uh, sometimes we're told no, even though it's a great idea. Well, so for you must have an opinion then on the uh, the recent uh, uh, drop of uh, remixes from the NHL and Adidas. Then, 
I don't have an opinion because I don't know enough about it. Okay, so uh, two weeks ago, they uh, they uh, were all over social media showing the, um, I guess, upcoming remix jerseys. And I don't know if it's for fans only or if it's going to be on on the ice and stuff. So, for example, um, uh, some of them... Uh, some of them are, are go deep and actually go, go uh, delve into some of the old logos and that kind of stuff. Uh, and some, frankly, are, are just not. Um, like, so, for example, uh, Nashville, uh, they're, they're going to do that. They're going to go back into the Hartford Whalers thing and, and uh, mix some colors with uh, some of the old logo uh, imagery there. And that, that's a sore topic for Hartford fans for a, a bunch of different reasons. Yes. But I'm looking at it now. Yeah. I'm looking at it now. Yeah. And, and you don't have to, I don't put you on the spot, but, but it is, um, you know, look, I think maybe where you're getting at is that, okay, there's some exclusive licensing of uh, current jerseys and stuff, and there's probably some rights to do that. But it's, it's interesting and maybe ironic, and maybe it's not that they're not necessarily capable. But here you are with an expertise that you built for literally from scratch, right? Where, it's ironic because your knowledge and expertise and 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 uh, attention to detail, yeah, frankly, is what they're going to have to learn. If the by the they license. don't care about my knowledge and expertise, see that's the that's what. Okay, the question that I am asked, maybe more than any, not not from journalists or situations like this, but from customers and the general public, why can't I buy a cap of the quality you do for a major league baseball team? Um, do you not want to pay for the license? Oh, we would love to pay for the license. The problem is that is a it's a it's almost a uh, red zone. We cannot go. Uh, they will not allow us to make a, a headwear piece, a vintage headwear piece, and it has nothing to do with our expertise and knowledge of the history. It has everything to do with who their partners are, and and um, and, and frankly, that's that's the door is closed. So all this stuff is about generating revenue. That's what we have to remember as fans. And as people like you and me who appreciate beauty and authenticity and accuracy, that's all great, but that's not what drives these designs and, and these products. It's, it's, it's to generate revenue. And so once it took me about 15 years before I got it in my thick head that that's why I was being told no a lot, not because uh, my design expertise and my knowledge wasn't respected. <laughs> All right. So, so let me, a uh, couple of roundup questions then. Um, and I think this, sure. th this one speaks to its, uh, what you just said. Um, so as a businessman, a small business at that, um, and, and by the way, I know you had a rough year this year with your, your, your the Seattle the store and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, our, our, We're actually doing very, very well. The store was, is very sad to close the store. We had a store for 25 years in that Pioneer Square neighborhood, and it I, it wasn't a big revenue generator compared to our, our online business. However, it was a place where people could physically come from some other state or country and physically come in and see the product and see us. It was very sad to close it, but um, we had to because there's just no uh, – the situation, even beyond COVID, uh, doing retail in, in downtown Seattle is, is not something that's sustainable. Um, and that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Fair, uh, fair, uh, fair disclosure. I, I lived in Seattle for a couple of years in the late nineties. And the first thing I did when I moved there was, uh, I made a pilgrimage to the store. So, but I digress. Well, um, appreciate that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I made a purchase or two too. So for what it's worth. Um, but here's the question. So you're, you're getting at sort of the business of it. it it's got to generate revenue. So, um, sure. I, I'm sure you've gone beyond uh, the logic of trying to figure out like what specific teams or what specific leagues or what specific ye year of team in league, you know, is going to be the quote unquote generator of money versus others. Um, I guess the question in there is, are you striving for the right sort of niche and, 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 and tapping into that perhaps on some kind of social current or whatever, or are you, are you aiming to be perhaps a bit comprehensive, right? Where you, there, there's no place else to go because you're the, uh, you do all that stuff, right? And it's like, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll get it in the aggregate, so to speak. That's a great question. And there's a, there's always a tension between uh, being 
the one-stop shopping of vintage, which <laughs> is one way to put it, um, and being a unique voice that's a little bit uh, in our own kind of, you know, having our own voice, I'll put it that way. Um, I think as long as I'm in charge of the company, it's going to be an extension of my voice and my particular interests to some degree, balanced with the fact that, as you said, we are a business, we have to we have to, you know, sell, we have to hopefully sell more rather than less. And that means that there are some areas like we, we didn't used to do the NFL and we, we're doing great with our NFL program right now. Um, and, you know, to, to the extent we can, I mean, I wish we could do a headwear piece. That would be lovely. Uh, and we, we don't have a license for that and, and we're limited in what we could do. So, I think our strategy in the last couple of years is to sort of supplement the kind of weird left field stuff we do, some of which takes off commercially and some of which doesn't, with some more established licenses like collegiate and NFL. However, we try to keep the authenticity thread always there and the way we approach things and the way we do them. Um, And we try not to ever compromise on those things. So I think if we have a balance of enough mainstream stuff people can relate to, like you want a, you know, New York Giants YA Tittle jersey, you can get one from us. But you want a really bizarre but really cool Kansas City Cats cap, you can get that too. Yeah, so it's a bit of a subsidy um, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, as long as we're not compromising for the sake of sales. Like I will never water down what I know is the correct or the right design you, if I could make something a little more accessible, you know, by tweaking it, you know, I tend to resist doing that because I, my opinion is I'm not a designer. History is a designer. And my job is to usher the thing from the black and white picture that I saw into into 3D, you know, reality in this in 2020 and make it accessible to people. And the way to do that is to get out of the way. And I, you haven't given me a question where I can pontificate a little bit about how poor I think so much sports graphic design is, is these days. Um, Jerry, Jerry, (laughs) what do you think? What do you think of the quality of sports logo design these days is? I think it's with a few notable exceptions, pretty bad. And and the reason it's bad is one word is computers, because uh, Adobe Illustrator gives gives a designer the ability to put 15 colors in a logo where there used to be two or three. And uh, and and my the watchword for athletic design for me is less is more. And if you look at the probably the most successful graphic in sports in the history of American sports, it's what the New York Yankee NY. And my, what I like to tell people is you've, if you gave one of these big six figure graphic design firms that these teams insist on hiring all the time to refresh their identities, um, that logo, and they didn't know anything about the Yankees, it would be tossed out immediately as too simple. Right. Um, so, so, so when I see things, you know, first of all, you know, they all copy each other. It's like ballparks. It's like anything. So if there was a time when every NBA logo to me looked like a version of the Superman shield, you know what I mean? And the first one was probably cool, but the fifth one wasn't as much. Yeah. Or the, or the angry uh, insect or the, or the dust. Oh God. That's got, teeth don't get now. me, don't get me started about angry animals, you know, animal cartoons. Um, yeah, and I just think it's it's like anything though. It's like art or anything. You have a few outliers that are very creative and very talented, and then you have a lot of mediocrity. Um, and I and I, I I read these articles with some amusement of the such and such a team hired so and so graphic design firm to redo their logos, and then I look at the results and it it says what they paid them, and I'm like, well, I could have done better, and I would have charged you a lot less. But, uh, but yeah, it's hard, but it's but, also, it's also big business and, and, and the Jersey business and the retros and the third kits and all that kind of stuff. I mean, this is all modern milking, shall we it say. Is. The, the and, and I realize and I realize that I am not in that world. And and uh, and therefore I I have some 
respect for the people who are in that world and have to come out with a third jersey for, you know, whatever team. But I will say from a point of view of timelessness um, and what becomes classic, you know, look at things like the Yankee NY. Why have the Dodgers not changed that Dodgers script in 60, 70 years? Probably because it works pretty well, you know, Uh <laughs> And and somebody drew that by hand in 1935 or whatever, and they're still basically using it. So um, I, I think that these more modern teams that don't have as much of a history, and there's lots of them now, obviously, they have a harder time because some of their stuff ends up being disposable. It's very fresh when it comes out. And in two, three years, they're out there again you know, having to get another identity, another third jersey. Um, and, and so, you know, we're just not in that world. All right, quick lightning round, and then I'll get you a wrap-up question, and then I'll let you go, sure. back, go back to your life. Um, all right, so lightning round, a couple, uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, glaring omissions. Um, but maybe for you, there's, there's a reason why yet not or never. Okay. Chicago Sting. Oh, you know, I get that a lot. I get that particular question a lot. And there's no reason. I have a I have an original Chicago Sting warm up jacket in my closet right now. We'll get to it. Um sticking with soccer, the major indoor soccer league. You know, I'm not uh I, I I'm not interested. I indoor soccer to me is kind of a uh I don't know. Uh what's I don't know. It, uh, no, not that. It's it's perfectly fine. It's just a kind of a, a, a distortion of a real game to create a made up game, and it's just not as interested. Plus, it's more. I, I, you know, I'd be honest with you, and and I'm very cranky. After about the mid '70s, I really don't care. I don't. I do not care. <laughs> it, it all the stuff graphically starts to lose its appeal for me. So a lot of the minor league teams and soccer teams and some of these other things that started, you know, once you get to the eighties, I'm just, it doesn't appeal to my own personal graphic sense as much. So generally speaking, I, I don't go there. Now that doesn't mean we we won't in the future but yeah. what, right now. What of the rest of the seventies though, a fertile uh, time for challenger leagues and, and new sports altogether. Yes. Well, team tennis, for example. You're right. No, you're right. I've been, I've been very, one thing that I, I will acknowledge is we've been very lapsed in paying attention to the seventies until very recently when we've done a lot, we've done a lot more, particularly in soccer, but um, I'd love to do more with the world football league, for example. Yeah. That was my other question. Um, so besides the general seventies, yeah. I, th I think also too, and I'm also trying to now sort of pull from the last three and a half years of conversations um, there's just a wealth of, of forgotten football leagues, right? Generally. There sure, there, there, there's, you know, it's just time. It just the amount of time we have in a day and you, you've seen our website, you know, how much stuff we offer. It's really hard to get, you know, the, the hard thing for us is when you've got everyone shopping and reading on this little device we hold in our hands. Now, it's very hard to give people a selection of, of, uh, 80 or 90 different categories of things to look at as it is hard to inventory that many things. So we have to pick and choose to some extent. And I can't always let my personal interest and curiosity drive what we commit resources to and, you know, manufacturing and, and inventory. And that's where it's a business. I'm yeah. sure our listeners are going to uh, uh, come up with their own uh, suggestions and stuff. So for, for what it's worth, but God forbid, um, but but you also cycle stuff through, right? It's not like I mean you have you yeah. said limited qualities quantities, but like for example, I can't find that Colt forty fives thing to save save my life anymore. No, the Colt forty fives. I think you're mistaken there because that's a major league baseball thing. We've never done that. Oh, interesting. Okay, it might have been a Mitchell and Ness jersey. It's a gorgeous jersey. I know exactly which one you're talking about. But um, we we don't do we've never done major league baseball teams, even vintage ones. Interesting. Okay, my except, except turn, we've done several turn back the clocks. Um, and we were the first company, by the way, to blow our horn a little bit that did turn back the clocks. It was our idea, the first ones that, that happened. And then it became kind of a thing. And then Major League Baseball decided to have an official licensee. And then we didn't do them. 
but, so, but things do cycle out, though, and you don't sort of bring them back or you just kind of put them on. I mean, I, I don't know if you do that by design or, or by just to keep things fresh. Or Yeah, we call it it's it's like a, um, a restaurant that has a seasonal menu. You know, what happened to that um, po' boy sandwich you guys used to serve? Well, we're going to bring that back in April. You know, so so that's that's kind of what we do. Um, we have some solid sellers that are always there. We'll always have the Homestead Grays cap. You know, we're always going to have that New York Knights Gray Hobbs jersey. And then there's some things we kind of like bring up. We want to talk about, uh, let's say, the South. We may come up with a, a set of baseball caps from uh, from the deep South and run them for a couple of months. And then maybe the top one or two sellers stay in the line and the rest get rotated out and we do something else the next month. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how we approach that. All right. And last question, I guess, is uh, any uh, holy grails out there, uh, things that like for you personally that you've you know, been chafing at or you've been thinking about or you've been tr- ta- trying to tackle, but for whatever reason, you've been stymied into sort of bringing into the- uh, not any one thing, though, I will say, boy, I wish there were more pictures of jackets. I wish there were more pictures of players in their warm-up jackets because some of those things were just so gorgeous. Um, I, I recently did a presentation for Major League Baseball on uh, on jackets, and in a couple of days, I found about 20 jackets that I had never seen, and some of them were quite extraordinary. A Kelly Green Chicago White Sox jacket from the 30s. Um, Kelly Green, because Comiskey was Irish. Of course, not not a team color on the White Sox. So I do wish there were more um, things that I can research that I didn't have to guess the colors on as much, you know, and that sort of stuff. It's pretty rare when you come across a, an actual cap or actual jersey that you could use in, in the research. Well, look, uh, this is we're, we're going to promote the hell out of uh, out of the site and stuff. Um, and this has been yeah, uh, tremendous. Uh, I guess I guess the other sort of general question I'll ask this is sort of not for the air, but um, no affiliate program. I, I you know, we'd love to throw some <laughs> some stuff your way. Uh, I, but uh, maybe that's for a reason. No, no, we just generally again, there's there's a limited amount of marketing attention that, that we have. And I've got one guy who here who does that. So, you know, we can certainly talk about it. Um, but there's no policy about it one way or the other. Um, but we just, we get a lot of requests and sometimes it's just easier to say, you know, not now because we're just, you know, you got to understand that, that creatively and administratively, this is like a four person show here. You know, um, so people who have to handle uh, the marketing and all the design and all the research and and we don't always have the bandwidth to 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 honor every affiliate request or something like that. Well, look, I look, this is um, this is it's fascinating. And frankly, it's a real pleasure because, um, you know, I I think you're in many respects, you're punching above your weight because I think your your influence uh, in this space is, uh, is outsized, uh, for sure. Um, and yeah, I, 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 no, and it's also, I wish I had the money people think I have from doing all this, <laughs> yeah, but, it, but, it, but it's also, look, I mean, and it's also, um, I don't want to oversell it either. It's also, frankly, in my little world and I think our little shared sort of world, it's important stuff, frankly, because a lot of this is actually it's history. And when you commemorate, uh, and and you do the just you do the, these items justice with the the research and the and the craftsmanship and all that kind of stuff. It's actually it does it's it's all a big part of keeping alive things that came before or or even today's big business and logos and teams and leagues and stuff uh, upon which uh, the, these things were built right. And so it's not unimportant stuff, frankly. No, I think it's very important. And I'll tell you something. It sounds corny, but the 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 same when someone comes to me and says, you know, my grandfather wore this jersey. Can you make one for me? That gives me as much of a thrill as it did in 1988. The fact that I can actually make that happen. And I'm the only one who can make that happen in this case. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, I feel bad for the people who say. 
I really want this particular year Philadelphia Athletics jersey. And I have to say, please go to the licensee for that product. And they said, I did, and they won't make it for me because it's a one-off. It's a one-piece, which we will. We will make, you know, a minor league jersey. If we've never made it before, I'll do the research for that one person, that one human being who it means the world to, to have that particular jersey. And there's very few companies who are able to do that. So it's not only history, but it's living history. And I, and I have this really quaint idea that we need to be connected with what came before us or everything is a muddle and doesn't really have any context. So we're still in it for the same reasons we were when we started. Jerry, this has been great. Uh, thank you. This is going to be a wonderful episode, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of our, our our mighty and growing uh, listenership. I, and I'm just I'm just shocked as to where in the world people listen to this show, and and others who uh, suffer from the same illness that I do, or maybe less so for yeah. you. Um, I, it's interesting because I think a lot of fans or people who listen, um, uh, a lot of it does seem to generate from their childhood memories of their first sort of sports. Uh, exposure and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it also seems to be, it also tends to be very um, uh, uh, narrow in focus, right? It's it's a baseball team in Major League Baseball or a football team in the World Football League, right? Um, sure. But I'm, I'm actually shocked at the growing number of people that we discover who have a broad and horizontal interest in the teams and the logos and the, just generally, um, which is itself, yeah. I thought was just the niche of a niche. But I know there is there's something to it and graphic design all there are other aspects to it that sort of fall in that fall into it. I think you, I think what what we're talking about here, what's great is that it, it ties together um, different aspects of Americana. It ties together history, um, social struggles. It ties together childhoods are, you know, because a lot of us, you know, our, our first experience of sports was, you know, that, you know, I hate to do cliche here, but you know, the dad took us to Yankee stadium to see the Yankees or wh whoever your team is. And those things are, those experiences are very, very powerful. I know they were for me being taken to the upper deck of Yankee stadium, not to see the Yankees, but the New York football giants was a very, very uh, powerful and exciting experience. Um, and I think that the graphics, if, if, if people like us and others who do this are, are doing it right, that's what it evokes when they see that logo. They're not just looking at a graphic. They're like, Oh my God, this is coming back. So, um, so I really hope that, uh, that, you know, when I go to bed at night, I try to hope that I've done something that day that has some meaning to people beyond it just being commerce. Commerce is what enables us to do it, but there has to be a, a higher purpose, I think. And uh, I don't want to be so grandiose as to say we, we, we have such a great high purpose, but I do think there's more than clothing, you know, in what we sell, I hope. All right, all the way from Seattle, we thank our new pal Jerry Cohen. And um, I, what else can I tell you? It's uh, just a tremendous uh, conversation. I, I enjoyed uh, uh, discussing all this stuff, and it's and Jerry certainly is a kindred soul, not only of my uh, myself, but I think of of many of our listeners as well. And again, Ebbets Field Flannels can be found at ebbets.com, e b b e t s dot com. And please enjoy, courtesy of Jerry and team and, and myself, 10% uh, off all of your purchases uh, this holiday season at Good Seats 10. That's the promo code, Good Seats, the number 10, uh, when you visit early and often at ebbets.com. And as I said earlier, not only are there great uh, NFL uh, wool jerseys and authentic jackets and uh, great sweatshirts and tons of baseball flannels and shirts and ball caps, uh, authentic hockey sweaters. Uh, collegiate stuff for sure. Uh, there's the brand new collection of just tremendously awesome and uh, never before seen uh, soccer, pro soccer stuff. Uh, great jackets. There's a Cleveland Stokers, uh, the LA Aztecs, the New York Generals of the National Professional Soccer League. Uh, the jackets are just, they're satin, they're beautiful. Um, the ball caps 
are awesome. There's one from uh, our pal uh, Ronnie Solano, Solano uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, was just uh, ecstatic to know that there was a Cincinnati Comets 1972 American Soccer League cap. Uh, it's great. Vancouver Royals from 1968's uh, NASL. Of course, the Atlanta Chiefs, uh, our old pal uh, Waylon Moore, who was uh, uh, instrumental in creating the logo for those Atlanta Chiefs. Uh, it just It's all great stuff, and uh, you're just going to love it all. And um, we thank Jerry uh, for the time and the, uh, the, the discount code, and, uh, and we hope you enjoy uh, not only uh, our little chat this week, but uh, all the great wares from now and going forward uh, at, at, at ebbets.com. It's Ebbets Field Flannels uh, in Seattle. Um, of course, our thanks to all of our great sponsors. Uh, please check them out and use them, too. Uh, and all those promo codes that we've talked to you, talk to you about uh, over the many, many episodes, you'll find them on our website as well for uh, your holiday shopping needs. And uh, that website, of course, is goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, if you uh, forget any of them, you uh, can also just search up any of the old episodes or just uh, check out the commerce or the merch. Yeah, it's the merch uh, tab on our website. You'll find all, all the codes there. Uh, and let's see what else you want to follow us on social media. You can do that at Good Seats Still. That's uh, us on Twitter uh, and on uh, Instagram. You can find us at Good Seats Still Available. And there's a Facebook page devoted to us uh, as well. Oh, I've almost forgot. If you want to follow uh, Ebbets Field Flannels, you can do those on all those three sites as well, uh, too. Yes. Uh, on Instagram uh, and uh, on Twitter, you can follow Ebbets Field Flannels at Ebbets Vintage. At Ebbets Vintage on both Instagram as well as Twitter. And of course, there's a Facebook page devoted to Ebbets Field Flannels uh, as well. All right. So that's all your social stuff. Good for you uh, to follow all those, of course. Uh, our website, I just mentioned. Uh, if you want to get our weekly newsletter, you can do that too by just uh, finding a little tab on our website and just giving us your name and email address and you'll be added to the list and you'll get our little weekly updates. Happy to send those along to you. And what else? Uh, our pal Jerry Payne. Yes, the other Jerry in our life this week, uh, but each and every week, of course. Uh, he of Jerry Payne Audio Excellence. Uh, he is the uh, uh, the person that uh, editorially puts all of our pieces together and uh, does a fine job uh, in doing so each and every week. We could not do this show without him and his help. And uh, we thank him kindly. We bow in his uh, general direction and we tip our uh, high quality uh, ball cap uh, from Ebbets in his general direction. Thank you, kind sir. And um, I think that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. More great stuff for you next week. And uh, please be safe. Uh, please be sane. And uh, the beginnings of happy holidays to all of you. Uh, see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.